Right, listen, I don't know how long it's going to take you lot to, to realise this. I'm like that annoying spot on the side of your face. I don't give up, all right? So I said, are we ready? Because if you were moved as much as I was during that last session there, this is going to be incredible because I didn't put two and two together till I was sat listening to it. But we're going to get to see the other side of the story. Up here on stage is Jamie and Keith as well. This is going to blow your mind. Ladies and gentlemen, Keith and Jay Long. Give them a round of applause. What's up, bro? What it do? <laughs> hey, would y'all believe that this is actually the first time that Jay and I have ever actually met in person? Uh, this is actually a, a pretty special day to me. Me uh, too, bro. Yeah. Me too. He's become literally... <clears throat> We got introduced uh, two years ago, a uh, little over, well, almost three years ago now. Um, they had just come out of this story, and, and man, when we started Boom, um, man, it was just amazing to watch the Lord begin to connect us literally all over the world. And uh, we didn't know it, but we had a mutual friend, um, and I felt led to pour into to this guy's music, right? And so I was like, hey, man, I was like, the Lord is wanting me to pour into your music. Uh, my kids love it. I love it. I think it's going to be amazing. And I was like, so what do you think about that? And he's sitting in my living room, and he goes, man, he goes, you got to talk to my, my boy Jay Long. And I was like, who's Jay Long, man? And he's like, man, man, Jay Fam. And I was like, oh, I've seen Jay Fam before. Like, I've seen that on, on some of your stuff. But I was like, I don't know who that is. And he goes, but here's the deal, man. Like, if you want to talk to Jay Long, you got to talk to him at like two or three in the morning. And I was like, man, my walls went up, man. I was like, who is this dude, you know, that I have no clue who he is. So the next day, actually, my phone rang and my wife was at the IF gathering, uh, which is a women's gathering uh, that happens all around the world. And, uh, and, and this, this mutual friend calls us and he says, hey, I got Jay on the line. Can you talk? And I was like, yeah, man, let's go. Let's chop it up. So we get on the line, and I'll never forget the very first time I talked to Jay. Man, he, he just comes in, and he just starts spitting scripture. And I'll never forget it. And, and, and this mutual friend of ours had told me, he was like, man, this dude, he was in this, this hip-hop group called Pretty Ricky and, and all this kind of stuff, and he traveled the world, and, and he played in front of 20,000 in London, and, and he was top 40 billboard, and all this kind of stuff, and I'm like, man, who am I talking to? And I'll never forget whenever I was, I was listening to him, my guard was up, because I just didn't know this guy. And he stopped right in the middle, and he said, hey, listen, you don't have to believe everything I'm telling you. He goes, just ask the Lord about me. And I was like, man, that's bold. <laughs> that is bold confidence in the Lord. And so I asked right then, I said, Lord, tell me about this man. And the Lord responded back. He goes, he's pure. He's mine. And I was like, hey, I don't know if you remember this, but I was like, hey, I'd already asked, man. I said, let's chop it up. Let's go. So we stayed on the phone for probably three hours, four hours that Sunday and got to know each other. And I, what I like to refer to it as is unity of the spirit. He's full of the spirit. I'm full of the spirit. And it's like we've known each other our whole lives. I say the same thing about Cobus over there. They're sitting on the, in the corner over there from South Africa. Unity of the Spirit is this powerful moment where two spirit-filled men come together and they begin to sharpen one another. And it's powerful. It's powerful. You go beyond talking about the weather and sports or you know all this junk, man. The way that our conversations go is nothing but talking about the kingdom, literally. I mean, I don't think we've, we've maybe talked football once. It always turns into us talking about the Lord. But then when it turned into talking about the kingdom. Uh, we found principles that were surrounded in, in football and talking about the kingdom. So I'll never forget as he began to share his story. Uh, he told me, man, you got to hear my story. And I was like, I got to hear your story, right? Because Revelation 12, 11, like I said earlier, says they defeated him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb, Jesus first, and the word of their testimony or their story. It's the God story that you just can't argue with. And you say, man, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that a woman with a life sentence in prison would get released only by God. 
only by God, because she was going to go out on a mission to talk about him all over the world. He's looking for people to pour into so that they can overflow and pour out. And this is one of those men. So tell us about your background, man. You were raised in Houston, Texas. Yeah, uh, a country, country city outside of Houston by the name of Lamarck. It's probably 15 minutes away from Galveston, Texas. So a little country city outside of Lamarck. Um, yeah, man, and uh, was raised in, in a pretty much a musical family. Um, my, I have a very famous uncle. He's uh, probably our parents' parents listen to him. Uh, he was a part of the original Ink Spots. And um, my, my grandfather, he was a mus musician for a lot of blues bands and uh, a lot of your, your famous blues, blues, blues people and B.B. Kings and all those people used to hang out at my grandmother's house. So I pretty much was raised around music. Um, I started playing drums in the church at a very young age. I was two years old when I started playing drums at church. And um, that would later on turn into me um, having a, a singing career. And uh, I think I got my first record deal when I was 17. And um, I got a, a, my big break around the time I was like 21, 22. That's when I, you know, um, I joined Pretty Ricky. And, you know, it's like everything kind of just took off fast, man. You know, it's, it's like I was performing in front of 200 people at one time. And then the next, next thing I knew, it was 20,000. And... I remember when, before getting in Pretty Ricky, I, w I had nothing, like I was, I, was, I was praying, I was asking the Lord, I was like, Lord, if you just, just take care of my career, like just, just give me this career that I just, I, I want. I mean, I just wanted that fame, I wanted that, you know, just give me this career. And it's like, you got me. And it was a news flash that came across my, my phone, it was the sidekicks at the time, it was the sidekicks. And it was telling me that Pretty Ricky was looking for a, a member. One of their members had left and they were looking for one. So I said, Lord, this is it, put me in this group. Um, totally forgetting about that prayer that I prayed that day. I was sitting in my broke down car with a, with a trash bag on the back window because it was busted out. So, you know, uh, totally forgetting that prayer. Fast forwarding two years later, I was actually in Pretty Ricky, and it didn't hit me until it hit me when I looked up, and I was like, and the Lord said, well, you remember what you asked me for? I gave it to you. But I was like, uh, but I don't want to do my part. I like the fame. I don't, you know, I want to kind of ignore you a little bit more because this is, this is good. The fame, the money, the, you know, the people screaming your name, and oh, man, I love this. And it's like, okay, do your thing. And... It wasn't a year and a half later, man, I'm on tour. I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. And the night before, I had a meeting that next morning. My road manager, we were all together, and he was telling me I had a, I had a meeting the next morning. And he was saying, hey, man, it's time. Like, you've reached, like, you're about to, it's about to boom for you, you know? And I was like, all right, cool. And he started telling me these strange things. He say, man, they, they might require you to do this, and they might require you to do that. And everything he was telling me, it went against the grain of what I believed in, my integrity. And I was like, hey, man, I'm talented enough. I don't want to do that to, why do, no, man, it's just a part of it. It's, it's just how things go. And I'm just like, eh, I don't know, man. Anyway, the next morning came, I got in the car, man, and we're on our way to this meeting. This man just told me what I was about to walk into. I totally ignored it, thinking that it was something so special about me that I would have to bypass this initiation. And right before we got there, the Spirit of the Lord hit me. A ton of bricks. Boom. Turn around. Go back to the hotel pack your bags, and go back to Houston. It's over. I go back to Houston. My business partner, you know, he's excited. We, we got this big tour coming up. 
but he's like, why am I looking at you right? Why are you here and why aren't you there? And I looked him in his face and I said, hey man, um, the Lord called me off the road and I, I had put this man on a pedestal, man. And me telling him, I thought at the, in that moment, like, he's gonna have my back, he's gonna understand. Put this man on a pedestal. I called him my father, not just my my business partner, but like my father, because you know I wasn't close to my father like that. And when I told him that, I looked in his eyes, and he said, "So what do you mean to tell me God came from the sky and talked to you?" I knew right then and there that it was one on one time with me and God, bro. And I would say that was a dark. It was one of the darkest moments in my life because. It was, it was just me and God, man. You know what I'm saying? With it being me and God, it's like, and, and I didn't understand, you know. Um, I worked so hard to, to build this career of my own. And I got it only for the Lord to say no. And um, I'll start right there, man. I'll let yeah. you talk a little bit more, man. Yeah, so... You know, one of the things I remember you telling me is, is the Lord got a hold of you at that moment because you had like you had like a, a big contract yes. on the line, right? Like yes. you were about to resign with Pretty, Pretty Ricky, and this was like seven figures. Like this was a yeah. big contract, yeah. right? Uh, and the Lord came in, if I remember right, and He said, "Hey, you can serve the world in money, or you can serve me." Yeah. And that's the moment that you turned and and you walked away from it all, right? Yes. Yeah. And man, so as you walked away from it all. And not knowing what you were going to do, right? So then, so then one morning, you're sitting there, and the Lord wakes you up early, and you watch some YouTube video, right? Well, what happened was, um, that was, I think, what, like, four years had been by since I had been off the road. And I, I, I'm like, what am I, what, what is my assignment? What am I supposed to do, Lord? You called me off the road. I'm trying to figure this thing out. What am I doing? And I remember, like, saying, hey, man, like, you know, living that lifestyle I was living with Pretty Ricky, man, you know, fast women, fast cars, fast money. Uh, something inside of me, I always wanted to settle down. So I remember, like, even praying, all right, Lord, well, send me a wife, and, you know, I want to I wanna do the family thing. I want to do this. And, you know, again, you know, sometimes when we pray prayers, man, we think that God is supposed to, like, right then and there. Sometimes he does, but, you know, um, we think he's, he's going to answer him like right away. He does. We just don't see it right away, you know. Um, so four years go by, man, and I, I start trying to do music again. And I was like, well, maybe if I clean it up. Well, no, maybe if I do music that gives him glory. And I started doing that, and it was cool. It was, it was cool. It was, but something was still kind of missing. And... I started doing like little R&B songs again, cleaned them up, and I go to uh, LA. I did a little tour, I go to LA, and it, it's like I, I, f I felt like, okay, I ain't supposed to be doing this, it doesn't feel right. I go to LA, we have a meeting with Capitol Records, and they, give, they offer me the deal. And I mean, it's like everything just happening quick, 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 and I'm just like, eh. And uh, I remember, never forget the guy asked me, he said, hey, we want to give you the deal based off, I let them hear like four songs. He said, well, is your album done? And I said, yes, it wasn't. So <laughs> I said, yes, it's done. It wasn't. <laughs> so I lied. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, he said, well, listen, our offices closed down in December. At a certain part in December, he said, we close our offices for the holidays. He said, do you think before we close in December, I can get you back up here and listen to the whole album? I said, sure. So I said, look, look, turn to my cousin. I said, dude, we got like two weeks to put an album together. I go home, I'm having writer's block, something I never have. I'm having writer's block. And we record in, you know, I had, a, I had a, like an apartment we recorded in. And in this room, I left one of the TVs, I just always left it on. Um, it'll be on YouTube, I'll watch sports highlights, you know, 
It was a bed in there, I'd get some rest, and then I'd go right back in the other room in the studio, get back to work. It was this recommendation on my screen for three days, and I never clicked it. And my wife will tell you, I do not watch TV that long unless it's my Tennessee Titans. I just can't watch TV that long, you know? So I looked at this documentary, and it was an hour long. An hour, man. I said, yeah, ain't no way I'm watching this whole thing. I clicked it. I watched the whole thing. And it was my wife's story. She, she moved. She's she, actually over here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <It's> a, <laughs> as pretty got. as Matt is, yeah. he, she's yeah, not yeah. over there anymore. <laughs> Sorry. <man. laughs> so it was my wife's story. Uh, didn't know her, never heard of her. Um, uh, nobody was saying her name. It was an old PBS documentary that they had shot when she was actually 16 in this documentary. So, um, of course, you know, I, I was like, man, that, that was a messed up story. As I'm walking back to the other side to go back in the studio, the Lord stopped me right there and he said, uh, yeah, but write her a letter for me. And I'm like, and tell her what? I'm, I'm gonna talk to people, who, I'm gonna talk to strangers, like, tell her what? <laughs> And so he's like, just tell her, you know, introduce yourself to her and then tell her she's about to get out of prison. All right, man, I've really gone crazy. I said, I'm gonna be obedient. I wrote the letter and the way I wrote it, hey, look, my name is Jay, blah, blah, blah. Look, the Lord telling me to tell you, you getting out of prison, boom, 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 bam, bam, bam. Okay, cool, prepare yourself, you know. Um, I stick the letter in the envelope. He said, pull it out. I pull the letter back out. He said, now burn the edges for me. So I burn the edges. I put it back in there. Anything else you need me to do <laughs> with this letter, put it in the mail. Totally forgot that I wrote this girl a letter. I go back to California with the album done. Man goes crazy. Gives me the deal on the spot. I come back to Houston. I got a letter in the mail from her. She replied. I was like, oh, that girl wrote me back. So I read a letter and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And I'm telling you, you know, I write her back and I say, yeah, I'm just waiting for the holidays to go by because, you know, I just got a new deal with Capital and, you know, I'm getting ready to go back to L.A. I think they're going to move me to New York. So, you know, just getting prepared for that. And we start writing back, writing back. And one month will go by, two months, three, four. And the Lord said, hey, before you go to L.A. and go to New York, I need you to do me one more thing go visit her. And I was like, yo. All right. I kid you not. I tell her I want to come visit her and she's like, well, it's a process and that takes a long time for you to get approved to come into the prisons and it's paperwork. And I was like, look, I ain't got that much time. I'm finna have to go to LA so you can put the paperwork in. And that was my way of saying, God, well, look, I tried, you know trying to be, you know, I tried, you know. And so um, when she told me that, I was actually like, oh, it takes a long time? Yes. But then she calls me back and says, hey, this never happened. Your paperwork got approved in three days. <laughs> wow. So I get on the plane. I'm going to see this stranger I don't know totally off of obedience and I never forget got to the prison I walked in smooth everything was smooth I walk into this VG which they call the visiting gallery where they visit at and I see her she's like 12 feet away from me and as soon as I saw her, the Lord said, yeah, remember you prayed and asked for your wife? There she goes. And the 
we sat down. She probably thought I was crazy because I just kept repeating, well, why is she in here? <laughs> well, why is she in here? Now, mind you, we sat down at the table and that is the first thing I did. Well, why is she in here? And she's like, Jamie? <laughs> After I snap out of it, I said, all right, I'm gonna stay here for like 20 minutes and I'm leaving. It turned into a four hour conversation. I left and when I left out of there, I knew that deal in LA, I knew that wasn't it, man. So uh, I went to see her for the second time and this is what people don't know. Uh, me and her mom, you know, me and her mom, it got close and her mom would come to Houston and visit me. And I went to see her for the second time, but the second time wasn't like the first. When I went to see her for the second time, I went to surprise her on my birthday. I had seen her in April, my birthday is in June. I came back in June to see her for the second time. And I was met by like 20 prison guards. And they pulled me out of my car. My cousin was driving, we had, drove, we had just drove 12 hours to Nashville. It was my birthday, they pulled me out the car, they ran a dog around me. I mean, they treated me like I did something wrong. And I was like, man, what's going on? Uh, they look at me and they say, um, just to let you know, you can't come back in here and see her no more. I'm confused. Why not? They're laughing at me. That's when the Lord showed me. Passed his test. Revenge has always been something I dealt with. You hit me, I want to hit you back. You do something to me, I want to, I want to do something back. Pass this test. Man, they're making, a, they're making a mockery. How dare you? I'm Jay Long, man. Don't nobody talk to me. Don't talk to me like that. Humble yourself. Humble myself. And they looked at me and they said, yeah, you can't come back. <laughs> All right, you have a nice day. God bless you. And then as I'm walking off, one of them has the nerve to say, oh yeah, happy birthday. I get in the car, and the Lord said, because you just passed this test, go prepare and get ready for her to come home. But then it hit me, hold up, I have to tell her that what just happened. I told her, she was frantic, she was crying. I said, listen, it's gonna be okay. So we went on this journey for two years, man, and I had only seen her one time in my life. One time, <laughs> and we went on this journey. I knew she was my wife. It took that one time for me to see. And best decision I ever made to be obedient in that moment, the best decision I ever made. And when I go back and I look at our story and I think about our story, it sounds like a fairy tale to me. But I know it's real because I lived it. And I'm, I know I don't have the power to, to get this outcome. It, it's not me. It's, and so it's like I, I'm still at awe. I look at her, and she's not in those prison clothes. And, you know, it's, it's just a blessing, man. It's just a blessing. Y'all are going to have to forgive me. I'm, I'm uh, looking up a Bible verse real quick. Hold on. It's Romans 8. I want to talk about being obedient to the Lord, right? Because a lot of times you hear people say, man, I heard the voice of the Lord. I heard the voice of the Lord. And in our culture, we're, gonna, we're actually going to hear from uh, Boniface coming up next. And in, in the African culture, uh, 
the spirit realm over there is rich. It is rich. They're open to it. Western culture, I have learned, is very closed off to the spiritual realm. We're too educated. We know too much. We have too much information at our fingertips for us to be able to even understand the spiritual realm, right? And so, like, I'll tell you the very first time I ever heard God's voice, he said, sell everything and follow me. I was 29 years old. And I thought, was that God? You know? And I thought, I don't know, maybe. And so I called my wife, and I was like, hey, I think I heard God. I was like, but I'm not sure. But let's go ahead and, like, sell the house. We've been talking about it. It's been a burden. Why don't we sell the house? And so we talked for a few days on that and the ramifications that existed there. But here's what happens that I've learned when it's God's voice. It happens. It happens. <laughs> when God tells you that a woman who has a life sentence in prison with no chance for parole until she's 67 years old, and that's only because there's a statute that exists that says that she must get a hearing at 51 years, otherwise she's condemned for life, and all appeals have been denied, and the God of the universe says she's getting out. And then two years later, three years later, whatever the number was, bro, she's out. Yeah, it's, it's something we like to, we, we always like to call him the God of the turnaround because he turns around situations. They told her 51 years before she can even speak to a parole board. But the Lord took that 51 and said, no, she's just going to do 15 years and be out. Mm. <laughs> so he literally turned that 51 around. The God of turnaround. I like God that. God of the turnaround. So here's what Roman 8, Romans 8 says. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. You see, God's voice brings peace, where the enemy's voice brings destruction and, and chaos and anxiety and fear. And man, over the last two years, we have lived in nothing but anxiety, destruction, fear, right? Unless you're rooted in the Lord. And I'll tell you, I'll be the first one to admit that for my life, that there's times where I fall out of that, right? I find myself in the valley. But, but Psalm 23 says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. You're with me, right? And as we have got to know each other, man, uh, there's this linking between the spirit between you and I, right? And if I go back to my story, we tell the long story short, we tell the realtor what we want to ask, and he's like, man, he, he comes back and he's like, and I, mind you, I, I did not tell him that I thought I heard God's voice. Like, that was the last thing that was going to come out of, my, out of my mouth because I'm like, man, if I say this, this dude's going to think I am crazy, you know? And so uh, I keep that to myself. It's between me and my wife at that time. And he says, man, there's no way you're going to get that. There's no way that you're going to get that price. I was like, man, that's what they asked 18 months ago. You just got us a better deal. Like, you were a good realtor. Way to go. And uh, I was like, it's an 18-month-old price. Like, we should be good. He's like, man, I'm just telling you, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get any showings. You're not going to get any offers. You're not going to get anything. He goes, you're probably going to have to drop your price. And I was like, okay, you know. But I said, ask it anyway. And uh, so we asked it anyway. It rolls around. First day rolls around. And it was, we would get email notifications. And it was showing, showing, showing showing. And I was like, come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. And so we get to the, uh, the middle of the first day, and uh, the realtor calls me, and he says, hey. He goes, we got an offer coming in. And I was like, come on, man. He goes, now, we don't have all the details, but I'll call you later. And he called me later, and he said, hey, listen. He goes, you're not going to believe this. He goes, not only do they want to buy the house, they want to buy everything that's in it. <laughs> And I thought, sell everything and follow me. And it was the first time I'd ever heard God's voice, ever. But he confirmed himself. And that's what I love about our God is he is so consistent. He's so sovereign that the Bible says that his word does not return back to him void, but goes out to fulfill every purpose for which it's sent out. 
We have an incredible opportunity in this moment, in this time, to glorify a king. We've talked about before, how does, a, how does an infinite God, an eternal God, a God that exists from the beginning to the end, survive in a finite world? How does an infinite God survive in a finite world, a world that's dying? We're going to live maybe, maybe to 100. Maybe. We might live to 39. We, might, we don't know. But everything around us is dying. Everything. Everything around us is dying. Yet there's a God that is in control of the entire universe. That he desires glory from us. And we literally get ourselves so busy, so caught up in the chaos, so caught up in all the things, and we find ourselves in this place where, where we're so busy we don't even hear God. God says, I'm the still small voice. Well, how do you hear a still small voice, right? Man, you got to listen. You got to be still. Is where it says, be still and know that I am God. God linked us together to go out on a mission, right? My passion, your passion, has been that it's not up to me and it's not up to you, right? That each person uniquely understands their calling in God. Each person submits and says, God, what do you want? What do you want to do today? What do you want to do today? You want to burn edges on a piece of paper? <laughs> Let's do it. He was obedient. And it's through our obedience that we begin to glorify the Lord, right? So you were talking uh, recently, you and I were talking. And every time, man, like Jay will text me. Sometimes he texts me. It, it, it's true. It's like 2 or 3 in the morning. Like Jay's like... Bro, I got a word from the Lord. And I'm like, what do you got, man? It, well, I don't answer because I'm fast asleep, y'all. Um, but uh, I got a word from the Lord. And one of them really hit me recently. And I love it as we're, as we're talking about focusing and pace and, and pausing and all these things, right? He said, man, he called me one day and he goes, if I, if, if I were to ask you what color represents evil, what would you say? And I was like, black? And he goes, thank you. <laughs> like confirmation, he was like, thank you, thank you. And so I want you to talk about that that the Lord gave you. Um, and, and he began to ask me, okay, so, so what color is your shadow? Like if you see your shadow, what color is it? So I'm going to let you take it from here. Well, basically, see what... How he gave it to me is, man, we're trying to be perfect, and Brad was pretty much hitting that earlier. We're trying to be perfect in this flesh versus following the spirit of the Lord. The light. The light that sh the, the light sheds light on darkness, you know what I'm saying? So I said, if you look at our reflection as the, as the light shines on our flesh, which is dying, the reflection of it is, is darkness. That's not the light. So I now look at my shadow differently. I now look at, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. So I see, but it's, it's, I also see that everything I, I do, my shadow does. So if the spirit tells me to walk, you got to come with me. That the flesh, it, it has no more power over me. If I'm heeding to the spirit of the Lord, this it means nothing, man. But while I'm in it, I want to do, I don't want not one, not one work undone, man. Even a small thing, the smallest of the smallest thing. Because to what, to, to, to what us may seem small, that one little small, look, write a letter. Mm -hmm. Write a letter, burn the edges. She writes me back. Well, this is what she said. I wrote you back because you're really cute, but 
it was the, the burnt edges that got my attention. Small details, man. And seeing her go around the country, man, and so many people. I mean, she's touching so many people, and, you know, God is using her as a vessel to touch so many people, man. I just be like, man, this started from a letter. And he said, well, how do you think I presented my word to you in a letter? <laughs> so that let me know that the word is still alive and breathing today. I'm getting to read the book of Too Good. I'm getting to read the book of Jamie. I'm going to read the book of you, 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 everybody in here, and it's all connected. It's alive and breathing, man. It's alive, man. We could spend another five or so minutes together and uh, just just encourage the people out here, right? And so, like, you know, one of the things one of the things that I've learned as I've as I've visited with you on the phone and and we Facetimed maybe two or three times or something like that. But man, like every time I walk away from that conversation, uh, I'm like, <laughs> this man is so on fire for the Lord. So on fire for the Lord. And as I walked away, it's amazing how the Lord will interject into me, right? And so as you start talking about like our flesh following us and like in, in, in this idea that the, that the mind governed by uh, uh, the flesh is sin and death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace, right? And so as we position ourselves and we make this journey, like I've been so stuck on this idea of, of, of making this journey back to the garden, it's really not a journey anymore. I'm there, right? I'm in the garden with my father every day, no longer stressing, no longer worrying, no longer finding my peace in these things. And my eyes are focused on the light, the light of Christ. Now, here's something that as I walked away from that, as you planted a seed inside of me, this is the beauty of, of having another brother that you can talk and go deep with. I do this with, with Todd all the time. I do it with Steve we need it. We need small, intimate friendships that go beyond talking about going to the bar or talk about going to do this or going to do that. This is a fruit that is in my life now because of a seed that he planted. So as we keep our eyes focused on the Lord, right? If I face this light, which is really bright, <laughs> then what goes behind me? my shadow. But as I turn my back on the light, right? If that was the only lights on, then what do I see? I see my shadow. I see my flesh. You can see it right now. And so which one am I going to submit to? Am I going to turn my eyes to Christ or am I going to turn my back and do it my way? And I'm going to tell you that, man, my way did not work. It never has worked, but God's way always works, right? And sometimes, I'll tell you this, I've told people that boom is not a prosperity gospel. <laughs> it is actually the furthest thing from prosperity gospel uh, that I've ever been a part of. Jesus, if you will resonate, and I learned this from Steve, if you will sit and put yourself in the scripture, in the story, and be a person inside that story, you will begin to see things and understand things that you've never seen before. Jesus has just given the greatest sermon like of all time. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, right? And he brings it and all these people come and they gather. And then all of a sudden a Pharisee or a Sadducee runs up to him after the fact and he says, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. And what I love is Jesus doesn't sit there and go, man, come on, let's go. He doesn't do any of that. He literally looks at the man and he provides a challenge. He says, hey, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean, man? 
And so I began to pray about it, and I began to rest on it. And what he began to show me is that even the animals have a place to call home. Even they have comfort to know that, man, I can go back to that den or I can go back to that nest. But as for me, I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. But the things that are unsaid in that is he's like, man, (laughs) but the things you're going to see, when you follow me, it's not going to be comfortable. I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you high. It's going to be high challenge. I'm going to send you out on mission. I'm going to ask you to do things that are uncomfortable to you, like writing this letter to this lady that you don't even know about or walk away from million dollar contracts. Because what I have is better. What I have is better. And the things that you're going to see, man, you're going to witness me feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. You're going to witness me perform miracles. You're going to witness me raise people from the dead. You're going to witness. You will be my witness. The journey that we are on, we're going to die one day. We are. So what's going to be left behind? We talk about these things all the time, man. This is our conversation. This is literally how it goes. And when you talk about iron sharpening iron, this is what it looks like. Now, when I go back, and I work every day, right? Like There's times where he'll call me, and I'm like, it's the middle of the day. I can't talk right now, you know? But I'll find a little window at like 1230 or something when I'm at lunch, and we'll catch up, or, or early in the morning, or or late at night, or whatever the case may be, and we'll fuel one another, and we'll, and we'll, man, we'll just pour into one another, and I thank God for Jamie Long, man. I thank God for Jamie Long, because he's a man. thank God for you too, man. <laughs> he's a man on a mission, and part of what we want to do today is, is, is high challenge, but we also want to prove that God is real. God is real, and he wants to move in powerful and mighty ways But we have to be willing to submit and say, Lord, whatever you want to do. It's uncomfortable to walk with the Lord sometimes. I got a business right now that's losing money. Like, pretty good money. But he's providing for me over here. He's providing for me over here. And I look at my bank account and I'm like, man, we don't have a whole lot, man. We don't have a whole, whole lot. And he's like, Keith, I'm providing. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. My hope is no longer in my bank account. Your hope is no longer in, in your bank account or, your bent, or, the, or the Bentley or the things that you had, right? This dude had it all. He had it all. And he gave it all up so that Centoya could be set free to go and begin to change the world. We got two minutes. And I'm going to say something. One last thing. This man has a talent. <laughs> and he just came back to me as we're taking this trip back to the garden. This man has a talent that, that most do not. It's a God-given talent. This man is a musician, and he set it all down so that he could go on this journey with the Lord in Centoya. But now the Lord's asked you to pick it back up. Is that right? Yep. <laughs> and it's, it's crazy, man, because it's like when, when you want it versus like, Lord, I don't want it do that no more <laughs> and it's just it's 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 crazy man but yeah. obedience i'm gonna do it and um everybody else is more excited than i am about it <laughs> so uh i'm gonna do it and it's, it's gonna bring him glory yeah and um that's it and let me say this before i go my brother got really good teeth. I tell you that all the time. You got a really good set of choppers on you, brother. I just had to tell, you know, I had to tell the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that. Uh, my brother is a dentist. I do not see him, but he is a dentist. But uh, maybe it's just naturally in us. He's, I always joke that I'm like, people are like, man, too good. That's a great last name. And I'm like, yeah, in, until it's not. Uh, until something goes wrong. I was like, but my brother actually has me beat. He's like, he is Dr. Too Good. I'm like, Dr. Too Good? I'm like, that sounds like something that should be on like Grey's Anatomy. Like Dr. McDreamy and Dr. Too Good walk into the room. I'm like, man, that's pretty phenomenal. So 
Uh, but thank you, brother. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, and thank you all for even being here, um, uh, for inviting me and my wife to come down and, man, to see you in person for the first time. I mean, I... I you like my teeth? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but I knew that on FaceTime. But it's, I mean, seeing you in person, it feels no different from us just being on the phone. It felt like it, you know, like it's been forever, man. brother. So. Hey, y'all, unity of the Holy Spirit. There are guys walking this out every single day. And if you are not a part of a community of guys that are walking this out every day, go find it. Go find it because it is there for you to have and it is a gift that only the Lord can bring. <laughs> I'll say this one last thing. As we put you guys out on, out on mission, that is our purpose, that's our goal. Scripture says, what good is a lamp when you put a bowl over it? What good is a lamp when you put a bowl over it? It's of no value. I love my church. I come here pretty regularly, not every Sunday, because we have life and we have things that we do. I love my church. But it's hard to be a light inside of a, a room that is so lit up. We got to go out. As I was sharing with uh, Todd, Todd's on the front row. We're going to hear from him just a little bit at the very, very end. It's time to die to ourselves and rise up and walk a new life. But here was the challenge that the Lord gave to those disciples. He said, hey, drop your nets and follow me. He did not say drop your nets and believe in me. Todd just said, wow, but he actually is the one who said that. <laughs> it's like it hit him again for the second time. <laughs> Todd's the one who brought that revelation to me. He didn't say drop your nets and believe in me. He said drop your nets and follow me. We're going on a mission. We're going to wake up a generation. It's time to go. It's time to be lit by the Holy Spirit. Our world needs it, y'all. We're looking for hope. We're just looking in all the wrong places. <laughs> we love you guys. Man, I love you. Yeah, you're the man. You're the man. <laughs> all right. Hey. We, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, Centoya uh, does have a, she's written a book. I literally, I, forgive me, Brandy. I don't always read a whole lot of books. And she's been on me about a book that I need to read, and I haven't read it, so please forgive me. I'm saying that from the stage right now. But I read Centoya's book in like 24 hours. I went on a trip to Dallas, and I read this thing in 24 hours. And I got to a chapter, and it said, Burn Letters from Texas. And I was like, ah, here we go. But that book is out back, um, and she would love to, to meet you and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to break over the next 12 minutes, and, um, and, we're gonna, and then we're going to come back. And, man, we are going to hear from uh, the other side of the world, uh, Zambia, Africa, and Boniface Shanga. And you guys are about to be blessed. You guys are about to be blessed by a man of God uh, that you, it's going to be a blessing. So we're going to break. Uh, let's come back. Uh, you want to say we, yeah. yeah. I do want to say something. <laughs> he told me to be prepared. I'm the, listen, we've all been in this room since 1 o'clock, Yeah? Yeah. What did I say? We've been here since one o'clock, yeah? yeah? Before you got the letter, did you know who Jay Long was? No? Before you watched the documentary, did you know who that lady was? <laughs> now, if that is not something that 15-year-old Matt in England would only see in a movie or in a musical, then blow me down, guys. Because I have just sat, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ring my people back in the UK tonight, and I'm going to go, guys, you're not going to believe this. I was in a room with a lady today that was incarcerated for 15 years, but was supposed to be there for her life. Then... There was this musical genius that, and I come from the theatrical world. When he said he had to go back and write that album and be back there, I know what you were going through, man. I've had those deadlines with West End and Broadway shows. 
we, we live our life on it, yeah? Nothing else matters, yeah? He stops, he watches a documentary that's an hour long that he would never commit to. He leaves that TV and is stopped by a voice that says, you're going to write that girl a letter. Say what? And he did. She's sat here now. They're married. And this guy gave up not once but twice on two different contracts. And look at the love that is pouring through the pair of them right now. Now, if that's not a movie to make, then I don't know what is. I am... If, if my world was to be shut down tomorrow... I feel like I've had all the learning and love that I could ever experience just by hearing your two story. And we witnessed it, guys. We witnessed it, and it's real. This man, this man isn't Netflix, Netflix and that lady. They got Hulu subscriptions, all right? They got the full Monty, as we would say in the UK. We're going to take a break, reflect on that, buy that book, because I'm going to. What a read. We'll see you back here in nine minutes. Thank you very much.